I am Dr. Swanee Jet, and I have a passion for public health for over 30 years. Now, I'm in a position to affect change. And these are the critical conversations about health and our community with the people who can help me make those changes. Good afternoon, welcome to CEO Live Talks. I'm your host, Dr. Swanee Jed, and today I have the honor to bring Mr. Gibson to the stage. How you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you for coming today. Yes, sir. All right. So, you know, as I customarily do, you know, is bring new guests to the show, and, um, you know, you have a very important job. But before we get to that, you know, tell us a little bit about where you grew up at, um, and how did you land in Louisville if you're not from here? Absolutely. I actually, <clears throat> I grew up in southern Indiana. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, I had a very good mentor, father figure, that um, coaxed me in. He was on the Louisville Police Department at the time. Okay. And he thought that that'd be a good career for me. So um, that was like 1989. And I, uh, I joined the Louisville Police Department, moved over here. Um, and have never moved back and have settled here. Uh, got three three sons and now two grandsons here. Mm -hmm. So I'm very bought into Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, I care about it. Okay. So growing up in Southern Indiana, exactly where in Southern Indiana? Is it I kind of grew up around Galena, Indiana. I went okay. to Floyd Central High School, okay. uh, which is Floyd Central. right across the, the river here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a lot of family over there, but uh, I've... I've chosen Louisville to, to be my home. So brothers and sisters? I do. I had uh, two brothers. One of them passed away uh, back in 2007 mm -hmm. in an accident. But uh, other than that, no sisters. Uh, my, my mother's still alive. My father passed away a couple years ago. Okay. Um, so it's safe to say that you had both parents in the household? I, I, I did for most of it. For most uh, of it. Yeah. Okay. But uh, in my Approaching high school, my, my parents did divorce, okay. and uh, probably like many other families. Yeah. So did you play sports in high school? I did. I played basketball. Okay. Was you good? Uh, not good enough. <laughs> I wasn't going to make so, no money doing so, it, but so, so it I had a good time doing it, and uh, we went to uh, the final eight my senior year, so okay. uh, that was a good experience. That was a great experience. Uh, so I had a good time. Played for a Hall of Fame coach, a guy named Joe Hinton. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But I uh, had a good time, but realized I wasn't going to make no money doing that. I understand. I understand. So, but you learned some good lessons. Yes. In, in playing basketball, you learned how to win. Yep. Um, you know, those are things that you can't readily teach somebody, but it also gave you some work ethic. Yes. So give us some of your experiences that uh, Mr. Hinton taught you. Uh, well, obviously, he didn't believe in second place. That, you know, if you want to be the best, you have to push, push, push. You got to outwork the, uh, the person in, beside you in front of you because somebody's always working hard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I push myself to uh, be the best I can be. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things he taught me. You know, uh, if you don't have the skill set, then you have to out hustle somebody. Correct. Correct. So it gave you work ethic. Yes, sir. Okay. So what did your father tell you growing up? Well, he told me that if you can't be a ball player, at least look like one. <laughs> so when you come, you know, you, you got to look like part. you know what you're doing. Uh, at part. least, yes. <laughs> That's interesting. So uh, growing up in a household, you had two siblings. Uh, were you the youngest or the oldest? I'm the oldest. Okay. Yeah. So you had to lead by example. Yes. And so if you didn't, then either your mother or your father told you straighten up. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And so I'm assuming because somebody in the neighborhood was a police officer that led you down that path. You know, even though he was your mentor, why did you think that was the right fit for you? Well, you know, if you look back and you probably can do the same thing, you can name all the people that helped guide you mm -hmm. or gave you good advice. And I can name them on my hand, you know, even up to recently. You and you use when you find somebody, you 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 trust them, mm -hmm. you know. And you it's, that person normally has led a good life, or it could be somebody that didn't, but mm -hmm. learned from it. Mm -hmm. 
And even today, as you know, I'm approaching 60 and I've had, I've done all kinds of jobs. Well, there's still times I call those people and, mm -hmm. and check myself mm -hmm. and see what they think about what I'm getting ready to do. That's uh, called having good counsel yes. around. Um, and I always say bump was right or left because sometimes when you're in leadership roles, a lot of times, you know, well, I wouldn't say a lot of times, but sometimes people don't have the appropriate guidance or somebody around them. So they don't get in too deep. Yeah. And then you notice, as you, you know this yourself, is as you get older and you progress, you become that person that people call you. Unfortunate. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Unfortunate. Um, I was just told that today. I have a lot of hats. Um, I was like, yeah, maybe I do, maybe I don't. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about um, police. Yeah. And your thoughts now, because there's a lot going on in Louisville. There's a lot, you know, and it's it has changed. You know, the world has changed so much. And, you know, when I took it over, when I come on in 1989, I, you know, you ask yourself, why does somebody want to be a policeman? Right. And there's several reasons. Um, I've always wanted to be a helper. Um, I've always tried to live under the motto of be a problem solver, not a problem maker. Right. And we, when I, when I come on, you know, I, I wasn't a person, I did not like fighting. I did, I'm not a gun nut, right. you know, but we have to have police. And, but we, what concerns me today is that um, I still see, I, I just, every time you pick up the paper and you're like, how do, why did that officer do that? Mm. Now I understand some things that happen where you had to make a split second decision. Mm. Some people are better than that than others, but right. what I call a premeditated screw up, right. I just don't understand it anymore. Right. Uh, yeah. I just don't. Yeah, you, you know, I, I wonder sometimes um, what's the mindset, and only because, you know, I got a couple of friends that are police chiefs, and we have some gatherings in Florida, um, and they just like people like anybody else. Um, but we have a tight knit circle of friends. We get together, we drink, have parties or celebrations. And I notice in our, in their conversations, it's about culture. A lot of it is the culture you're trying to set. Um, but also they did something that I don't see a lot of communities do. I mean, it's some that do, they do community policing mm -hmm. and they hire people from the community, but they have no problem in being in the community and knowing, because I think like when I was going up in Chicago, you could understand or know what somebody's going to do something. You already knew who the bad actors were. So you wasn't policed in neighborhood per se. You was policing the bad actors. Um, and so I'm curious, I don't know if that still applies today. Yeah, I, I believe there are a lot of them probably afraid to get out of their car right now. Mm -hmm. And you know, that it's worrisome because when I came over here, as we've talked about in 1989, mm -hmm. it was a rigorous testing procedure. And when I took the written test, there was 1,500 people sign up to take the test. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot of people. And it was that way every, and it was that year, to, it was, it would do that two or three times a year. Right. When I was assist, assistant chief, probably, I think, I, I came under assistant chief under Chief White. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember. I mean, yep. Uh, loved working for him. Mm -hmm. I would consider him he a mentor. He left and went to Denver. He, yes. Colorado. So yes. I, remember. I was I was an executive at the health department. Actually, I think I might have been in Bully County by the time he left. Yeah, I learned a lot from him. Okay. You know, so but go, refer now. And then when I was assistant chief, I was in charge of putting all the hiring together for him mm -hmm. before he would choose. And it was getting to the point where we barely had 100, 150 candidates to choose from. Wow. And, um, you know, when I would look through that list, uh, unfortunately, there'd be a lot of them would have never made it when I did. Wow. And that is alarming, but it's that way across the country, you know. It and, is, it is. Uh, you know, if we talk about uh, the culture of policing now, we also have to talk about the culture of society. Right. You know, most recently this past weekend, I, I think you saw where they do donuts in the street, the street racing. Mm -hmm. Now, 
if we talk about mentors, there's no way I would have ever jumped on a police officer's hood. Right. I just wouldn't have done that. Right. I don't right. care what the incident was. Right. I'm not going to do that. Right. Yeah, no. I, and, I and probably wouldn't do that either. <laughs> I, yeah, you you wouldn't. And and it it just alarms me that we have we have individuals out here that um, they don't have no fear. Right. And they have no they don't respect. Right. So how we get to back to that point of them having the proper mentors that, you know, if I saw somebody doing something on TV right now and I knew them, I'd probably call them and say, what are you doing? Yeah. Hello, I'm Dr. Swanee Jett. Please make sure you visit one of our five locations, not only in Louisville, but outside of Louisville and surrounding areas. Thank you. Hi, I'm Destiny. I'm the Community Health Workers Manager here at Park Duval Community Health Center. This is my team of community health workers. Community health workers close care gaps, reduce barriers to care, and address health disparities in our community. Community healthcare workers act as a bridge between the patient and the provider to stay engaged in the healthcare plan. CHW strives to work as committed care team members for PDCHC, for current patients, and to provide access to those who need a new medical home. For more information, please visit pdchc.org or visit one of our centers. Thank you. And that was the case because growing up in, in my neighborhood, um, my parents didn't necessarily have the same thing to me. If somebody else saw it, they stopped it and brought it to attention. Yeah. But also, in our time frame when we grew up, you had to say yes, sir, no, sir, all the time. So I teach my young kids that. I've, I've taught all my kids that. But I make sure I instill the, that into them, that level of respect. But also, society, you have seen... Um, less regard for life, Yes. period. So the value of life or that compassion, um, I actually see it missing. So that's, yeah. the, that's the difficult part. And you can't police that. And I tell people all the time, coming from a public health perspective, um, I'm always thinking of prevention. So you would never have enough docs to cure disease and you would never have enough police to stop crime. No. That it's just not possible. Um, and so we have to use different techniques of prevention, but also just being able to take care of our neighborhoods different. We, we have to do that. Um, the, the number of shootings I see now, um, and crime is alarming, because I've been in Louisville since 95. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't a time period back then that I was afraid to go any place, but now I have to be a little more leery. So I understand. So how did you progress through your career to now end up at TARC? Well, I you mean, know. because that's a serious it, it, I've, <laughs> I've been several, several places. It has. You know, I, I, when I come on, I, I, my motto was, oh, I just wanted to, it goes back to my days of playing basketball. I just wanted to be the best I could be. Mm -hmm. You know, when I joined the, the police department in 89, I never said I want to be the chief of police. Mm -hmm. I want to be the best patrolman I can be. Okay. I did that for a while. Okay, let's, I want to be a detective. I do that and you work your way up through the ranks. And then, you know, luckily in 2007, I got promoted what I consider, uh, you know, when you go to a major, you're handpicked, mm -hmm. you know, by the chief and approval of the mayor. And at that time it was uh, Mayor Abramson and Chief White. And then he um, made me the major over downtown in the Russell neighborhood. And I did that for about four years, and then Chief White promoted me to assistant chief, put me over administration, which was hiring in the budget. Uh, did that a while, and then um, <clears throat> when he left, I got promoted to deputy chief, and then uh, uh, retired in 16 because, you know, per the pension, it was time, yeah. you know, and I, <clears throat> it had run its course, and, you know, things were changing, and it was it was time for me to, mm -hmm. to do something else, and uh, Retired and four months later got a call back and wanted me to see if I'd take over the animal shelter. Uh, it was a, it had been a probably a mess for a while. It was a mess for a while. I remember. We were in that old facility at Manslick mm -hmm. over there, and we uh, 
uh, we got, I hit the, hit the ground running and was able to uh, build a brand new state-of-the-art facility on Newburgh Road. Uh, actually turned it into a no-kill shelter for time and space. And in the fall of uh, 19, uh, I don't know if you remember a former chief here who has done a lot of things, Doug Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Doug Hamilton retired, and that's who I was reporting to. So um, at that time, they, uh, the Fisher Administration asked me if I would take that over, and uh, I was not ready to take all that. I was, uh, uh, my wife was like, what are you thinking? But I said, I'll, I'm always the person, I said, I'll do it till you find somebody. Okay. I can't leave you standing because you I just, be a stop gap. I'm old school. Right. You know, if you hire me, I'll do whatever I can to help I you. I don't want to do it forever. <laughs> yes. Let's see what, you <laughs> know, so, let's see where it goes. so I did that for about, I don't know, five months. And then uh, at the time I was over six agencies like corrections, fire, um, emergency services, uh, public works, fleet facilities, and animal shelters. So did that for five months, and they found Amy Hess mm -hmm. from the FBI. Yeah, I, I think I'm you know Amy. Amy. Yes, I do. So she came in, spent a month with her. I went back to the animal shelter for a month, and COVID hit. So then at that point, they brought me back in on a, on a team. You know, you got to set up certain things federally. Everybody was, you know, worried. And then a month later, they asked me what I take over and be over the health department. Yeah, and that um, was interesting. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Especially during COVID. <laughs> yes, you couldn't have asked for a better time, you know. So very, very proud of the work we did here in Louisville, you mm -hmm. know, setting up the, the, the clinic over there and the shots and trying to keep people calm because there was so much uncertainty about that. It was chaotic. At yeah. least, well, my time started different because I was on the clock January 2020 quarantine people and putting people in isolation in Massachusetts. So, Oh my, yes. So Cause we had it I, sooner than we, yeah, it was here a lot sooner. So by the time I came to Louisville, I was like, Oh, it's a little bit more calmer. I can help the health department. Out. So yes. It was a little bit different. It was. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I did that and then, um, we had civil unrest a month or so after that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, there were some changes at LMPD and, uh, they kind of put, you know, I, w I went back to the animal shelter and then they brought me back in again because uh, they had to do a, a search for a chief. And I was asked to take back on public works and fleet and facilities and uh, Riverport Authority. So I ended up doing that, all of that really through the rest of the Fisher administration. And then I, when I met Mayor Greenberg, um, I told him, I said, man, I'll do whatever I can to help you. Right. You know, I told him I got my sons here. I live here. You got a lot going on. <clears throat> if you can use me, you, you point me and I'll, I'll go do what you ask. So, you know, one of the things <clears throat> I pick up, and, and I don't know, I, I can't say for myself because I've probably been CEO four times now in different jobs. Um, so if you was to look back uh, at growing up, uh, what would you tell yourself different or would you do anything different? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I, I've had a storybook ride. Um, <clears throat> what you learn is, is the same way in basketball, <laughs> is, you know, there's got to be an opening in front of you to get anywhere. Right. And the only thing you can do is prep yourself and hope that uh, that opening happens. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that's through education, but a lot of it is, is building your reputation. Mm -hmm. Of that people, that if they say, man, you know Ozzie Gibson, what, what, is, what is he all about? Right. Because most times when uh, a CEO, they don't have time to do 100% in depth of your whole life story. Correct. They're going to ask around. They're going to ask about you. They're going to go to their mentors or people they know and say, have you, right. have you ever worked with this guy? You know, so one of the things that um, when I grew up, I, I tried that, that if you just give me an opportunity. I'm going to do the best I can do. You won't be disappointed. And I tell people now, you know, I've worked with a lot of political leaders here in this area in like Metro Council. And mm -hmm. all, whenever I meet a new one, all I ask them to do is let me give me time to fail you. Don't go over my head. You, you got a problem. You call me and we will walk through that. So that's important because one of the things um, <clears throat> that a lot of people sometimes don't understand about leadership is you got to have credibility. Yes. Um, and you People got to be able to trust you, but you have to be willing to build trust. Um, and those are critical things. So, you know, one of the things in listening to your story, 
um, in your career path is that people have been able to trust you yes. and rely upon you um, to know that you'll do a good job. And so that trust goes back and forth. They think it's not just one way. You actually give them trust and respect, but they also give you trust and respect back. And, yeah. and that's the mark of leadership. So what would somebody say um, that has worked for you is your best attribute? Uh, that I'm very, very straightforward. Um, I do not beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, funny, I get told that too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, straight shooter, mm -hmm. uh, I think is what they would say that, you know, if you come to work for me, I, just, I expect you to do your job and try to be the best you can be and always be tweaking yourself. Can you be better? You right. know, don't just get in a, a groove, but you know, I, I don't lie to people. And I, I guess somebody told me one time that they described me as Doug Hamilton, actually, he goes, he says what he means and he means what he says. Mm -hmm. Doug would say that. Yes, that's, <laughs> what, Doug that's what Doug that. said. Hello, I'm Dr. Swanee Jett, CEO for Park Duval Community Health Centers. We conduct WIC, nutrition, and open enrollment for healthcare. So this is a one-stop shop facility for everybody in the community. Hello, my name is Sierra Clark and I'm the Chronic Disease Manager at Park Duval Community Health Center. Ever since I started at Park Duval over nine years ago, I have been committed to helping patients live healthier lifestyles. I am currently serving patients in the Chronic Care Management Program or CCM program. My team and I help patients manage their chronic conditions such as obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. In this CCM program, you will receive several benefits to help you manage your health. We offer monthly telephone calls to check in with your progress and to assist you with any concerns, assistance with scheduling your healthcare appointments, and assistance with filling your prescriptions in a timely and convenient manner. We also offer many resources to help you with the barriers you may face with eating healthy, being physically active, or monitoring your conditions at home. For more information, visit us online at pdchc.org or visit one of our health centers. Hello, I'm Dr. Swanee Jett. Please make sure you visit one of our five locations, not only in Louisville, but outside of Louisville and surrounding areas. Thank you. I have worked um, as a health commissioner in the three prior places running health departments. And, and you know, I remember during COVID, um, of course, I got calls from all across the nation. Um, but when I got ready to do a mask mandate, uh, the community had to trust that I had the best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. um, because you can't go in front of the camera and lie. Um, so I was always straightforward. You know, here's the data I'm presenting, which I have press conferences probably once a week. And here's what I'm seeing, and here's why I want to shut down basketball for the high school, or shut down sports. Period. Um, of course, people were yeah. mad, but they they had to believe it, right? So now you're moving to a phase of Tark, and I know there's a lot going on, um, and you have a lot of lessons that you can share from the past in terms of why you're making decisions now. First, let me ask. How do you go about making decisions? Because that's a critical part. <clears throat> well, you know, even first of all, I don't, I don't. When I have to make a decision, and you're in public service, you can't worry about whether it's an R or a D, mm -hmm. all right? Because we are all in this together, mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter what your skin color. We are all in this together, and that's. I looked at that as a policeman. Is that I'm, you know, I'm no better or different than anybody, and I. Even my employees now, I, I have an open door policy, and I grew, I I bleed the way everybody else does. Right. I've been, I've tried to be smart about my career. I've been lucky, but I'm no, I'm no better than anybody else. So, when I go like the decisions we're going to have to make at Tart, first thing we have to do is be physical responsible, money wise, mm -hmm. you know, and we have to balance our book. And our books are showing us right now that we're we're headed towards that financial cliff. So. Our decision right now is the more time we can have for our community to decide what they want to do right. of how they want to fund. That's the best thing that I can give the community and the citizens and the mayor is is time because right. 
Um, this has kind of hit everybody quick. You know, public transportation as a whole across the country has taken a hit. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I've, I've read reports where Washington, D.C. is theirs is like 750 million. That's, That's a, a lot. That is a monster. Yeah. And that is the city, you know, big, big cities like that, they rely on that way heavier than we do. Yes, they do. Um, there's normally been some uh, federal funds to help. And right now that's not there for people. So, um, you know, Mayor Greenberg, he wanted to act now. And that is kind of what we're doing. And, you know, the lucky, the best thing we had going for us in our city is this grant that we got to do our TARP 2025. Okay. We are way ahead of the game. You know, there's a lot of other cities that are sitting back hoping the feds will swoop in and throw some money out there. If they do great, right. that'll help us. But we're still going to um, you have look, to plan. We have to plan and we yeah. still should reroute, you know. Right. Uh, so my decision making is to, to buy us time to see what is best for our community. Yeah. And I, and I'm a, a data person. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I haven't taken a bus much in Louisville, um, but I watch the routes that come to Park DeVoe at the sub bus sites. And so it's just me. If, if I think you live in Fern Creek, or um, PRP, someplace like that. And I, I'm a novice at traveling on the bus. Besides Chicago, buses ran every 10 minutes in mm -hmm. Chicago, which is different. I would think that you wouldn't need a car because you're that far out, because you chose to live that far out. Um, I would think more traffic in the city to try to get to different spots probably would be a lot more riders. Is that right? Is that is that is that my assumption is correct? Yeah, you know, from talking to the consultant, there's several things about our city is one is you want to design routes wherever you live, where can you go in 45 minutes the fastest and how often? Okay. That's how they design. They use their data to right. do that. Um, Louisville is unique. Um, we think we have traffic problems and we don't. Not like big cities. Not like Chicago or New York. No. So, you ha you know, when I asked him the question, I'm like, well, why would somebody ride a TARP bus? And, he, you know, then he starts explaining to me the pros to ride it. And then the cons, he goes, your gas prices are, are still reasonable mm -hmm. and you've got a car lot on every corner. So people can, can find cars if they want. But, um, you know, a lot of the people that ride our bus have to. Okay. And, and, and they can't afford a car. And, you know, uh, the other thing he's talked about, he said, if we could come in and design a city from scratch, everybody could be so much better. Yeah. But you, you know that from public health. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way how most of these cities was built. It, it wasn't built for traffic that we have now. No. Or just how the routes are done. It wasn't, it wasn't much engineering work going on. <laughs> no. I mean, if you look where the people live that need, want a good paying job mm -hmm. and where the good paying jobs have developed across Jefferson County, they're far out. They're far out. So to get people that really want to make themselves better, it costs money to get them there. Right. And that's kind of what has happened.